Sharing their insights today, I'd like to welcome to the stage all of our panellists and please make your way up as, as I introduce you. Firstly to Tegan Mossop, winner of the WA Training Awards Trainer of the Year in 2016. Tegan works for North Regional TAFE as an access lecturer based in Fitzroy Crossing in the Kimberley. She delivers programs to adults and youth in remote communities across the Fitzroy Valley and she provides support with underpinning skills for industry qualifications and language, literacy and numeracy. Tegan also delivers gaining access to training and employment, an employability skills course to Aboriginal youth. So welcome Tegan, looking forward to hearing from you. Our second panel member is Dr. Teresa O'Brien. Teresa has an extensive background in education within the VET and university sector. She is a principal lecturer at a regional TAFE institute and holds a master and doctoral degree in education. She has a wealth of experience working in diverse so social and cultural contexts and across various industry and community and organisations. And her professional interests over the last 20 years have been geared towards the use of technology technology by TAFE teachers. So thank you, Dr. Teresa O'Brien, and looking forward to hearing from you as well. Just get my hair. Our next panel member is Ashley Donkin. Ashley was born and raised in the regional town of Cambalda, population 1500. She commenced learning online as a way to complete years 11 and 12 without having to take the two hour round trip to the nearest high school, which was located in Kalgoorlie. Once she had graduated high school, Ash began studying online through TAFE for certificates three and four of graphic design and has now moved on to the diploma. Never a huge fan of the city, studying online has been an amazing experience as it has allowed Ash to live and study in the country among her friends and also family. And studying online has opened up doors to opportunities that she would never have known existed and allowed her to set goals that otherwise would have been well out of reach. Welcome to you, Ash. Our final panel member is Professor Jilly Salmon. Professor Salmon is one of the world's leading thinkers around learning futures and pedagogical innovation. She researches and publishes widely on the themes of innovation and change in higher education and the exploitation of new technologies of all kinds in the service of learning. She is internationally renowned for her significant contributions to online education, including research, learning design, teaching methods, and the use of digital technologies. And among so many of her roles and qualifications, Jilly is currently Pro Vice Chancellor, Education Innovation at the University of Western Australia. She has also established the Centre for Education Futures to realise UWA's Education Futures Principles and Visions. A big welcome to you, Professor. And your panel facilitator for today is Rod Cam. As you've heard, Rod, Chief Executive of the Australian Council of Private Education and Training. Rod has had a long career in vet field, including as Managing Director at the National Centre for Vocational Education Research and Chief Executive of Skills Queensland. And before that, Rod was Associate Director General of the Queensland Department of Education and Training and CEO of Construction Skills Queensland. So I'll hand it over to you, Rob. Would you please welcome Rod to the lectern and a big welcome and looking forward to hearing from you all to all of our panellists today. Thanks, Rod. Uh, thank you, Karen, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what a great morning to be in uh, Western Australia. It's actually quite intimidating. Can I say congratulations for starting with the student perspective? Like we, we hear a lot about quality, but ultimately that's what matters. So to those three students, I was just so intimidated and uh, it was just a fantastic story. And I'm just as intimidated about what we're about to hear about today in the panel session. Now, don't worry. The message we got last year is you wanted more opportunities for questions. I get it. My job is to get out of the way. So uh, today we're going to hear about some really cool stuff. We've heard about the debate for quality. We're going to hear about students today. 
uh, you've already started to hear about the student perspective. We're going to hear about teaching in this whole quality debate. We don't hear enough about the role of teaching, the role of different learning styles. And of course, we're actually going to hear a little bit about evidence. So evidence is always a pretty nice way to start. So to, to frame the first discussion, we're pretty lucky to have Professor Jilly Salmon, who's internationally recognised, as you've just heard, for her research in this important field. And the one thing I know about the different generations and the different learning styles is we all argue we're on the cusp of the previous generation. So no one's a baby boomer, they're on the cusp of baby boomer and Gen X. I'm quite worried about what's next. If it's Gen Z, we've run out of letters. Stop so, with, stop with A. Okay, so we go back to A, there you go. <laughs> so look, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, Jilly's going to frame this discussion so we get what we do every day. So without further ado, Professor, may I invite you to the lectern if that's where you'd like to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And <clears throat> Thanks for the introduction. My mother would believe it, but nobody else would. So um, just to say, in, a, in another era and in another country, I definitely wouldn't be here um, if it wasn't for people like you. I certainly wasn't born with any educational advantages whatsoever. There were no books in my house. I'd sort of say working class, but nobody did any working. So... Um, <laughs> So, and it was really over a long period of time um, that, you know, that happened. And I did what um, all girls of that age did in that time, got married at 18, produced four children fairly quickly. And um, actually, if it hadn't have been for the Open University, I wouldn't have actually proceeded in the UK. So um, I, too, was immensely impressed by our student representatives today. And, and Thomas, thank you very much for the reminder about the goals. And that's something that drives me too. But uh, um, so here I am ready to go. Um, so I also heard right at the beginning that this was all about questions. Um, and just in case somebody didn't ask, um, I'm going to say that I thought we should have a bit of a look about what it means by X, Y, and Z. So at least we've all got a bit of an idea of what we're talking about. This is quite a good study, actually. I'll leave these slides with you, and there is a link. You can explore them much more. And I think if you're planning, that's a great thing to do. The thing about planning for the future is that you can set goals, but you don't know whether they're right. So it's a bit different from actually planning what you're going to do next week or planning your own career even, that the future has a, a, a way of throwing up surprises. So one of the main goals that you have to have is to be flexible and to be able to respond over time. So I just about fitted in the baby boomer. I don't think they labelled my generation, but there you go, going back further. But... As the baby boomers, they are the largest generation in history, um, and, and a lot of them are starting to retire now. Um, but the generation X, Y, and Z are going to fill all these positions. So that's what the ones that we're looking to train as we go through. So um, generation Y was sort of 1977 to 94. So they were also pre-internet, pre-digital, really. Um, and Generation Z is the one that you wanted to talk about and the ones that are coming through. However, there's still quite a few of us hanging about from Z and Y, I think, as well. Um, so um, this study actually came up with some, a few key messages which I think are very helpful. Um, so the Generation X, we were all about balancing work and family time, which often meant as females we were hanging back, um, worrying about who's going to pick up the kids and so on, and that is starting to change quite a lot. Um, Generation Y said, never confuse your career with your life. I was in the UK at the time, and we were the Thatcher generation, and we knew how to party, I tell you. Um, <laughs> Um, and the Generation Z, the motto that they've got is we are the always-on generation. So then, you know, the, the whole thing about work-life balance is starting to change. You heard 
that so much from our fabulous award-winning students that you heard from. Absolutely amazing. Um, so in other words, they're always connected to the potential um, to learning as well as the rest of their life and their social life. And so that's one of the things I'm going to say a bit more about. Um, and looking forward, there also seems to be some differences in their approach to life and careers. So the Generation X, um, you know, they wanted to start, we wanted to start our own business. Certainly as women, that was one of the things I did um, uh, during the boom times of the 80s and 90s. Uh, I started a number of businesses then because we felt that doing it ourselves was probably the way. Don't ask me how I ended up as a university professor. Another story, another day. Um, and then Generation Y, we wanted to be kind of the text expert. Generation Z are really, really um, what's called digital natives. I mean, my last, I think my last three grandchildren, they've just been born into a world where they always swipe, they never turn pages, you know. So they really are used to a very different world from what we were born into. Um, and Generation Z are particularly concerned, by the way, about uh, boosting their people skills. The always on tech hasn't changed that. They've realized it's all about people. So a few, few clues for us from the study. Um, now, I just wondered if any of you um, thought this was had any familiarity. It certainly has familiarity of those of you who've ever studied at UWA. It's, um, there's actually been a thousand years of history of university education. Um, and it's spilled over into schools. I could put a similar one up for schools, similar one up for sort of TAFE, college, and training providers. Um, this is actually a Bologna, um, which was the first European, modern European university in nearly a thousand years established. Um, and this is a, a picture of what students did then. I don't think it's that different. If you're giving a lecture, just like I'm doing now, and not engaging with the audience, this is what the audience looks like. So lecture means to read, so people are reading. Um, you can see the front row. They look a bit like iPads to me, but I expect, <laughs> I expect they were books at the time. They will be actually not looking. They will be reading or taking notes. The next row, not quite so keen. Um, they are sort of trying to keep up, but they're having a little of a chat, and there's one guy eyeing up another one and so on. And when you, when you get to the last row, this looks pretty familiar to me. Um, there certainly is one having a sleep. Uh, <clears throat> there's, there's one sort of making a date for later, and so on. And really, this is what lectures look like these days. So really, unless you break the mode of just simply standing up in the front like this, which is what you're going to do today, I know, then this is always how your audience will behave. Um, so this is what we're doing at the Centre for Education Futures at UWA. We think that actually technology-enabled learning is the future, and so we're exploring a whole range of ways of actually doing this. And yes, it's more random. Yes, it's less familiar. Um, but that's our responsibility as earlier generations to provide that kind of experience. Um, we actually work on this. Um, we actually divide education into eight components. Um, and I'm going to bore you with it because it's all on my website, so you can have a look. Um, but you'll see for Generation X, um, there was a different kind of uh, responsibility for the, uh, for the training provider. And Generation Y, the students, there was a little bit of a move more to them being customers, um, a little bit of different understanding of how knowledge is acquired. You heard today about how much it's acquired from peers and experience. 
Um, but we're actually looking towards Generation Z needing something really pretty different uh, and becoming the co-developers of their own learning. Um, so that's kind of what you're designed for rather than the delivery of content. And if any of you like this stuff, it's all on my website, it's all open. So I'll give you the reference. So one of the things we're doing at UWA um, to try and change the paradigm towards um, the new generation is learning with mobile devices because we think that this actually provides context rather than content. So you can have your training in your pocket, but you're actually in the authentic real world. So that's one little tip of a way to think about um, providing things differently. Um, we're also in the Futures Observatory, and I'm, I invite all of you to come and have a play in the Futures Observatory, which is in Hackett Hall at UWA. Just get in touch with me, and our colleagues would be delighted to bore you with their virtual reality. Um, but it's cheap, it's easy, and it's a way of linking with much more authentic learning. Um, so you can see some of the things that we're doing here. Um, move on. Um, you can also travel back in time. Um, this is through virtual reality, the, the Vive, which means that you can actually, it's got movement in it as well. Um, so this is one of our projects at the moment where medieval history students are actually taking part in jousting rather than learning about it. Um, we also activated learning spaces. There's some amazing statistics about very, very few students at the university now borrow books. So most of the spaces, this is the Reed Library. Anyone remember the Reed Library in their day? Uh, this is what the Reed Library looks like now. No books, it's all informal spaces um, and all fantastic Wi-Fi. And this is what students want. It's the informal, formal learning and the links between them. Um, this is um, Ruby, um, Ruby the robot. If you come and see us at the Futures Observatory, she'll show you around. Okay, so the, the, the idea of humanoid robots, they're fairly cheap. They're fairly easy, um, and that means that people engage with them. And particularly, I mean, Dusty Lee was talking about how she didn't relate well to the conventional learning at school, and, and later we have found a whole range of students relate well um, to Ruby as their teacher. So watch out, guys. Yeah, Ruby is coming. Um, so mobile devices, we just know that they are transformational. So that's one little clue. So what's next for learning? If you don't know it, I've just put this reference up there, the Horizon Reports. Um, they're, they're free, um, uh, they're done yearly. I'm on the panel, um, and so are about 50 other people around the world, and they predict, which is always a terrible thing to do because you always look very silly, but as I've explained, I'm at the point of my career, I don't mind about that too much now. Um, and they will predict the kinds of technologies for teaching at all levels that are coming up short, medium and long term. So if you're planning, use the horizon reports rather than base it on something that you used to know. And then also in the horizon reports, what's stopping us? So there's all sorts of reasons why you might not. But as my personal trainer says, none of them are valid. OK. <laughs> um, so things that are solvable, like digital literature, it's tough, but can be done. Things that are difficult are the achievement gap. You, you all know more about, much more about that than I do. Um, but there's some that's called a wicked problem. This doesn't mean it's naughty, but it means we don't know the answer. But it means you have to try and try and try and prototype things till we come up with the answer. So that same report I'm referencing for you, that will help you with all of these and definitely worth a look. And as I say, it's free and open and it's updated every year. Um, move. And that's it from me. I hope that gets us started. Do you remember the generations? Yeah? 
Okay, do you know where you placed yourself in that? Um, thank you very much. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day. It sounds great. Um, and don't forget, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance much less. Thanks for your... Thanks for your... Uh, thank you, Professor. A very good story. I should thank you for uh, describing to me the importance of mobile technology. As a parent who's constantly grappled with my children about putting the phone down, now they can say, Dad, we're learning. <laughs> so that's just fantastic. I also learnt from your picture as to why my teachers always wanted me in the front row. I was, I think, in my senior certificate at school, it said Rod's uh, got this inc capacity to learn whilst distracting everyone else in the class. Welcome to my leadership style. Uh, a thousand years, you said universities. Well, of course, we've got people here who specialise in apprenticeships who have been here since pretty much uh, the start. So what a rich, vibrant history we have. So you've learnt about the, the, the learning styles. Even if I wanted to argue I was generation Y or Z, I failed every single test that was put up on the screen. So it looks like I'm uh, being thrown to history. Uh, but we're now going to hear some, from some, some learners and some experts uh, on different aspects of th this part of learning. Online education, it's almost become the Voldemort of, of education. That's my little segue to try and look cool, right? Uh, completion rates, you can't possibly have good completion rates from online, or can we? Uh, you can't possibly engage learners constantly utilising technology, or can we? So the next speaker you're going to really enjoy, and of course she's been introduced, Tegan Mossop from, from, from regional Western Australia. Now the best thing to know about how to make education work in regional Australia is to listen to the pragmatisms of the story. And Tegan now regrets telling me a little story about the, the tribulation she experienced just to get here. Uh, and that is, of course, she's rushing to make a plane at the last minute, which to me means the taxi hasn't turned up or the app's not working on Uber. But to her, it means a flat tyre in a desolate place in Western Australia. And the, prag and the jack didn't work, if I recall. I'd give up. You know, I'd open the wine and say that was that. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, can you please welcome Tegan to give us a real compelling story, Tegan. And you can do it from there if you'd so like. Gen Z. Uh, like Gilly said, they are digital natives, so they have the world at their fingertips, they have constant entertainment at their fingertips, they have infinite inf information at their fingertips. So for them, technology is no longer a new tool, it's a way of life. And they're also constantly entertained, engaged and stimulated. So they're used to having information uh, presented to them in visual and engaging ways. And this has set the bar to a new level. So for us as trainers or in the vet sector, this is what we have to compete with or keep up with. And the effect of this on practice is that uh, technology firstly needs to be incorporated into training in new and exciting ways. So as we know, technology is moving really rapidly and whether we like it or not, um, we have to keep up if we expect to engage this generation. So we need to incorporate audiovisual um, elements. We need to incorporate new interactive apps, programs, devices, uh, content-rich websites, um, social media, etc. Uh, if we want to be current and we want to be respected by this generation. Now there are countless ways to do this. I'm sure everyone's got their own ways, and the more we share them, the better. Um, just a few examples that I can think of that have worked really well for me uh, is iMovie tutorials, so teaching students to make their own professional videos. And video projects can be really easily incorporated into uh, any topic or any industry area. For example, when I teach a um, health and wellbeing unit, I always incorporate a video project where the students film their own cooking show. Uh, mockumentaries can be a really comical and fun way, uh, fun addition to any training task. Uh, Powtoon is an, a program where students can create their own animated 
um, video presentation. I guess it's an alternative to PowerPoint and there's loads of alternatives to PowerPoint out there these days. Um, I don't know the position that you're all in, but if you, if you are a trainer or you're sitting there thinking, I mean, all these ideas are great, but how am I ever going to find the time to incorporate all these new elements of technology? Uh, if you think it would really benefit your students and you think your students have that need, perhaps you could partner up with an access lecturer, uh, someone who delivers CAVs or USIC, and that can add extra time to your program. And, and that lecturer can also take responsibility for the technology focus and deliver that training. Um, although uh, technology is without a doubt um, an effective and excellent way to engage this generation, um, I just want to point out that I don't think we should forget that uh, it's by no means the only way. So just because this generation, yes, they do expect to be engaged, this doesn't mean that they have to have their eyes glued to one screen or another 24-7. So there's countless ways to engage this generation. Um, physical activity, competition, scavenger hunts, art, problem solving. I mean, the list goes on forever. But uh, the key is it just it needs to be edgy. It needs to be engaging. It needs to be fun. We need to spark the interest of these young people who do seem to be uh, quite easily bored. Um, which brings me to my next point. Uh, Generation Z were born into a fast pace, um, ever-changing digital world. So they know no other pace other than fast. They don't remember another time like many of us do. So they're also extraordinarily good at multitasking. So you'll see them messaging while watching TV, while listening to music, while online shopping, or while cooking their breakfast. That's wired into their brain. It's natural. It's second nature. Um, and the effect of this on practice is that we need to provide fast-paced, multimodal training. So, for example, uh, I know there's probably loads of examples uh, in a metropolitan scene um, in these photos, Gilly, that you were showing, you know, with lots, so, so much going in in these new library spaces. But for me, the examples are very different uh, from the Kimberley. Um, for example, uh, we run a training event in the Kimberley that focuses on language, literacy and numeracy, communication skills, team building skills and the underpinning skills of conservation and land management. And we run it like a three-day outdoor Olympics and it's completely insane. There's, there's initial Olympic challenges where the students are all um, running through blindfolded mazes and spear throwing numeracy challenges, followed by really quick uh, round robin activities, followed by the students all over the countryside with GPSs and coordinates, finding all the materials that they need to then build a raft, to then quickly go into the ocean races. And this is all happening while simultaneously they're expected to be preparing for a camp oven cook off and making a movie. So it's the fast pace, it's having lots of different things going on consecutively or simultaneously that's very effective with Generation Z. And actually I've found Generation Z have in this way raised the bar for everyone and I find that everyone actually loves this pace and this style of training. Uh, which brings me to my next point, which is learning environments. So Generation Z, uh, they don't really have the need for so much rote learning. They can access information whenever they like here. So they can get the formulas here uh, at any time, but they might, not, they might not necessarily know how to use them. So it's, it's more important for Generation Z to know how to use the information and to practice using it. So they also expect to be able to, to feel, to see, to hear, to touch, to experience learning. So the effect of these two things on practice is that this has changed the learning environment. So in the past, the learning environment was a room keeping students in, distractions out, and students facing the teacher. But for Generation Z, the learning environment, it needs to reflect their world and their needs. So the teacher is no longer the sacred provider of all information because Google is. And the teacher is the facilitator guiding the students to learn through experiences. Um, so the learning environment, more than ever, it needs to be student-centered, it needs to be action-packed, it needs to have different things going on simultaneously, it needs to accommodate for an extremely diverse student group, uh, new technologies and multiple learning styles. Now, for example, I run an employability skills course in the Kimberley, 
uh, around a, um, a community project or an enterprise. So uh, last year, my year 10 students decided that they wanted to do a boab nut enterprise. So they were collecting the boab nuts from those big fat boab trees that grow in the Kimberley and they were painting them and selling them in Melbourne. So in, in any one particular session, there might be one group of students off collecting boab nuts, one group of students painting boab nuts, another group of students creating an animated advertisement, another group of students contacting businesses, and another group of students organising an, an event. And there's some fluidity um, but amongst that as, as individual students or groups are changing um, as it happens naturally and as need be. Now, uh, and at the end of that, the students all come together and they all report on their achievements and what they've done and where they're up to and then together they decide on future plans and roles for the next session. Now this is a really uh, successful way to, in terms of engagement um, for a project to work with Generation Z but it's also the way that things are really done in the workplace and in the real world. Another example is uh, I can deliver maths lessons in a classroom and they're fine, but the best maths lessons that I ever deliver with Generation Z are of a different style. For example, scavenger hunts are really popular. So if I, um, the scavenger hunts that I've run where students are in groups, they have, uh, they have a vehicle, they have a driver who is also a support for them, either a teacher or some sort of a learning support, and they're competing in numeracy challenges all over town. And they have iPad with them, so if they, can't, if they don't know the information or they come across a problem or they can't do something, they can look it up themselves on the iPad. They've got the internet there, they've got access to programs, and they've got a wealth of information on there, and they've got the support of their learning support or their teacher as well. And they love this style of learning. They don't get bored, they love the experience, they're in control of their learning, and they better retain what they've learned. And I've got one last point that I wanted to bring up as well, and that's actually uh, disadvantage. So although within this understanding uh, that technology is at the forefront of this generation, and uh, it's actually important to remember that um, some people are more advantaged than others in the technology that they have access to. So although it's generally conceived that in this day and age every household has a computer and every young person has the world at their fingertips and is tech savvy, uh, it's not always the case. And where I live in the Kimberley, it's, I guess, strikingly obvious. And many people there face socioeconomic and remote disadvantage. Uh, where the town where I live, um, most houses do not have a computer. Many communities don't have any internet or phone reception or any public access to computers. Um, there's no free Wi-Fi in town. And many people can't, just actually can't afford to have a phone and maintain it with data and credit. And on top of all this, although yes, Gen Z, they do seem to have an inbuilt intuition with technology and they can swipe and click themselves into next week, they might not have the language, literacy, numeracy skills to use these devices for many education or learning purposes without encouragement and guidance and facilitation. So I know in the vet sector we're, I guess, hyper aware of the computerization of the workplace and the importance of building a workforce that's highly skilled with technology to match tomorrow's industry's needs. Uh, with this in mind, I guess as a trainer, um, and for all of us that are trainers, we must ensure that we're providing adequate opportunities and support for all our young people and for everyone and providing extra support and opportunities for those who do face remote disadvantage or socioeconomic disadvantage or any disadvantage, so they too have the chance to gain the skills necessary to be an equal part of tomorrow's competitive workforce. Wow, Tegan, thank you so much. That's a really compelling uh, argument and it might be just me but I think she's saying the days of just PDFing a document and whacking it on the web are over. Uh, Dr Google is a challenge for all of us because uh, uh, certainly uh, a lot of young people or maybe just my children believe if it's on Dr Google it's correct uh, and I have many debates uh, but really what I got out of that uh, and particularly for this audience is despite all of that the role of the teacher 
is still central to ensuring you know, that the younger generations are engaged in their education and just the innovation required at the coalface, if you like, is quite an intimidating thought. So on that note, I'm really pleased our next speaker, Doc, Dr. Theresa O'Brien, will help us uh, understand that role. Uh, she has a compelling background in education, in vocation education at university. She's currently a principal lecturer at a regional TAFE college, so really has uh, a deep understanding of what it's, what's required to engage uh, our learners. I notice she's a self-described geek. Your words, not mine. I was told at school, be nice to the geeks because you'll end up working for them. Uh, certainly, what I really like, if, if you haven't read uh, uh, Teresa's background, there's a really strong message that, that pretty much says, unless we accept the transformational power of technology, uh, vocational education and training is pretty much uh, in peril. So, uh, uh, Dr. O'Brien, I'm going to hand to you, and you can do it from here or there. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please w w welcome. Thank you very much, Rod. Um, just before I start, I want to um, thank the Department of Training Workforce Development for um, allowing this day, and I think nine, ten years, I think it's been going on, or maybe even more. So thank you to the department. <clears throat> When we talk about the learning styles of Generation Z and how they affect teaching practice, I think I'd prefer to speak about learning preferences rather than learning styles. Because um, much of what we hear about this generation isn't about styles, it's about preferences. We do know that they're prolific users of technology. They learn it quickly and they enjoy it. They're increasingly self-aware, self-reliant, and they enjoy it. Um, the ego, eco, con not ego conscious, that's a bit of a Freudian slip, sorry about that. Um, I mean eco-conscious and concerned about the human impact on the environment. They're highly observant, inquisitive, and they support a shared global economy of Airbnbs, Ubers and upskilling. They're quite trusting. For them, learning has to be convenient and has to fit within the right time, type, time schedules between probably several part-time jobs, family commitments and a really hectic social life. They have a sense of entitlement to a good quality education. They deserve that, they think. The issue is that um, their use of personal technology is not consistent with the education, um, the traditional educational system, the ideologies and practices that have remained unchanged for over a century. And I'm really um, quite aware now that here am I standing, transmitting content or disseminating information to a group of colleagues. Now, this dissonance has significant implications for vocational education, for how the students learn, Generation Z learn, um, and what they learn in their personal life is out of whack with what they learn in the educational sphere, leading to incongruence between the student and the teacher and their goals. So a generation of students is now here who have arrived in many ways, who are in many ways much more um, technologically sophisticated than their predecessors. And they have the power to force and change how <coughs> vet teachers teach. We've heard, um, it's not to say the teaching hasn't been changing over the um, last couple of generations, certainly as technology has sort of become a lot more, um, has advanced much more um, rapidly. Um, we've already seen, and as Jilly um, has just described, and as Tegan have, has just described as well, there are changes um, in place. And it's great to see what's happening at the University of Western Australia as well, and I'm sure we can all sort of learn a lot from that. Um, there's a, the gamification, massive open online courses, learning management systems, there's a, ho systems, there's a whole lot more there than were ever there before. We've seen a focus from teacher-directed teaching to student, um, a focus on student learning. It's not just, though, that teachers need to be able to provide choices and provide learning experiences in a range of modes to a range of learners to address the learning styles. It's much more than that. The problem facing us as vet professionals today is that our teacher, that we speak an outdated language and we're struggling to teach a population that speaks an entirely new language. 
we need to consider other ways of teaching, or should I say alternative pedagogies, that is, ways of teaching. So our teaching aligns <coughs> excuse me, with the needs of our students. Students have access to information that undermines, weakens and threatens our role as the sole authority of the source of information, and it has increased the student's power. So what is the role of the VET system and the VET sector? We have always played a really pivotal role in preparing students for the workplace. Technology and its rapid pace of development conflicts with the slow pace of educational change. So what types of knowledge do we as VET professionals now need? We need three really important types of knowledge. We need content knowledge, we need pedagogical knowledge, and technology knowledge. Content specialist expertise knowledge is not and is no longer sufficient to work in the VET sector. We also need the knowledge of how to teach. And technology knowledge goes without saying. This isn't an argument about the need for teachers to develop technology knowledge to address the needs of um, Generation Z. I adopt the position that teachers may lack sufficient knowledge to teach with technology, presenting a significant barrier as to how we might use it in our um, teaching. As we know, technology knowledge is always going to be a moving target. Keeping up isn't possible, yet we need to frame our thinking around the teacher knowledge required for meaningful teaching and learning in the 21st century. A lot of the VET teachers come from industry. They're experts in the industry. But you can't assume that they've got the sufficient knowledge to be able to teach. And it's certainly not an insult by any means. It's not the um, industry person's fault. It might be the system. I consider the Cert IV in training and assessment that does not teach you how to teach. In fact, neither does the diploma of vocational education and training. Historically, the transmission model of education has always informed VET practice, and we saw the, the slides up there. The model doesn't work anymore because students can produce their own knowledge, and we don't need to tell them what they need to know. Behaviourist principles are intricately embedded in the VET system and have for a very long time. It's embedded in the system as an institution through competency-based training and units of competency. The behaviourist tradition is as evident in the Cert for training and assessment as any other qualification or unit of competency. Now, the there's nothing wrong with the transmission model. For some qualifications, it's really important, and I think of electrotechnology. You can't go constructing or deconstructing wires. So the transmission model from master to apprentice is quite acceptable. Pressures to transform our practice, to change, um, to adapt to this world and meet the needs of our students and workplaces means changing our practice. Adopting new ways of teaching presents challenges to teachers' fundamental beliefs and assumptions about what teaching and learning is. So a move towards um, student-centred learning means letting go, that's us letting go and adopting new models. Most vet teacher, um, most of us were taught under this transmission model, and that's how we teach now, and this is what we know. After all, the way we were taught is the way we will teach. So the pressure on us to integrate um, digital and technology tools into practices represents a really significant paradigm shift for teachers within our sector. It implies loss of control, loss of authority, and worse, for some, loss of identity. Changing our core beliefs about teaching, knowledge and learning is, takes a lot of energy. I recently undertook some doctoral research in the VET sector and the findings were really interesting. Some of the very key findings were that VET teachers expressed traditional understandings, tra tra um, traditional understandings, transmissive beliefs about learning, knowledge, learning, yeah, teaching, learning and knowledge. They talked about imparting knowledge. They talked about watch, just watch me do it and you repeat. 
very much um, behaviourist. The teachers, though, valued the um, constructivist affordances of the technology, but they lacked the means to harness its potential to change their teaching practice. They heard about how good the technology was, as we're hearing here today. But to shift means changing our practice, which is quite difficult to do. We also, um, in the, the research was that vet teachers use technology to help their own teaching, not to transform the content or not to enhance student learning. Technology was used as an administrative aid. Didn't have to write it out, I could type it. It made life easier, it saved time, um, provided cost efficiencies, it was used to present information, and the technology was a really useful source of information. Rarely, though, was technology used to create or produce something. And that is what the constructivist model is about. Let's stop feeding the students. Let's allow, allow them to produce. Let's use the student as the source of knowledge. We are not the sole authority. Vet teachers in this study expressed positive attitudes towards technology, but their intentions to develop further technology was for personal purposes or for professional purposes. Um, certainly not to transform their teaching. Um, their Technology use, I think the most alarming finding from this research was teachers' technology use was largely shaped by their perceptions of their students. I know, Tegan, you just sort of referred to that. There is a reality, students don't have access, especially in the country, and while we take for granted everyone's got a, a smartphone, there are many, certainly in my little regional community, many of them don't have it because they can't afford it. The teachers perceived their students as having really poor technology skills, low language literacy and numeracy skills. They weren't mature enough. They weren't self-regulated self enough. They needed to be controlled and they needed intense support. Now, that was the reasons why some of the teachers didn't um, use the technology. Now, interesting to me was it all serves to um, demonstrate the need for teachers to control the learning. And I'm, so I'm just going to move just a little bit further here. So what are the implications for vet training? Well, there were um, inconsistencies between what the teachers believed about technology and what they were actually doing. They didn't recognise the need to adapt their teaching practices to accommodate the change the technology allowed. They didn't consider or reflect on the need for change, to change anything at all. They didn't have an awareness of the multiple ways in which technology could transform their teaching. They extolled the virtues of the technology, believing that it enhanced the students' learning, but they didn't know how to use it. But, um, Technology had the potential for communication, collaboration, flexibility, independence, connectivity, but they weren't able to realise that. They did recognise the alignment between technology and the pedagogy. Again, they could not manage the transition. Now, these results, while seemingly unfair to vet teachers, and it's not supposed to be, but these findings are consistent with findings about te te uh, sorry, teachers around the rest of the world. I'm talking about secondary education in Italy. I'm talking about university um, lecturers in Singapore. All over the world, the same, my findings supported their findings. But we need to do something about that. It's really critical that we do acknowledge the interplay or the intersection of those three knowledge bases that teachers need. It's not a matter of adding technology on, it's a matter of seeing technology as really integral. If you can just imagine a Venn diagram where the technology content and pedagogy forms a Venn, we need to get to the bottom where we're combining it, and that's the model that we want to work towards for a new um, VET pedagogy. Now, a few of the things that I think I would like to certainly um, see as potential solutions is in our professional de development programs, promote the need for reflection. Reflection on our beliefs, what we really believe <coughs> knowledge means, what we really believe learning is, and try and move on from the ways that we were taught, because the ways we were taught was not with the technologies that are available now. We need to promote this idea of constructivist um, practice, because teachers, for the most part, have not been exposed to it. 
When I say teachers here, I mean teachers at all of the sectors, the higher education, the vocational, the secondary and the primary sectors. Even um, new teachers who are coming out, you would expect them to have some technology knowledge, even those teachers aren't using it to full advantage in um, their schools because they're more worried about controlling the students. We need, um, we need to change the source of knowledge, where knowledge comes from. We are not the sole owners of knowledge. Um, and I think we have to move on that students are very, very good at producing knowledge. What was held out as really important authoritative knowledge in the past is changing. What we knew as fact in the past is no longer fact. It's been challenged. So we've got the reflection, promote constructive um, practices, see the students as the source of knowledge. And another one is um, promote a culture um, for sharing knowledge and expertise. And I think, um, Jilly said earlier, her stuff was um, on the university website and it was free. That's what we need to be doing as well, making sure that what we produce is free and shared, because after all, we don't own knowledge. Um, we need um, the, a model of best practice. Exposing teachers to best um, practice models of teaching with technology would at least ensure that students were engaged in higher order thinking, and many of us yet haven't seen what that looks like. What we need is a whole of organisational um, approach now that we've got some um, departmental people here, probably a nice departmental approach as well. Strong leadership should be embedded into the culture of an organisation to support the development of teacher knowledge. Teachers, um, oh, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, there is a need for our vocational education training teacher education program, namely the CERT IV. Um, to broaden the paradigm upon you know, which we are taught so we can prepare students for Generation Z learning. Only then can we dismantle the traditional behaviourist assumptions that have underpin, underpinned VET um, practice in the past. Wow, okay, so teaching's not that easy. <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, look, a sort of compelling story, and that's the real takeaway for me, just the challenge uh, of teachers and trainers in how to use technology in, in transferring learning to a generation who are far more digitally adaptive and, and, and advanced, and that's a tremendous challenge. Again, I keep reflecting on my children. They laugh every time I try and ring a restaurant to book a a, 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 a re make a reservation for dinner, and they go, look, I'll just do it for you, and they'll do it on an app. And, and I'm tremendously embarrassed most of the time. So we've spoken a lot about the role of online learning. Uh, already we're picking up that it's not just about the online bit, it's about the whole journey and it's about the important role of the teacher and trainer. Uh, I touched on at the start about this notion that online learning can't engage learners, can't produce the absolute quality results that we desperately need in vocational and tertiary education. Well, uh, the next speaker will refute that. We're about to hear a compelling story from Ashley Donkin, a student who has used online lear learning to achieve some fantastic personal and career goals. I won't tell you her story because I know she wants to. Ashley, over to you. Hello everybody, my name is Ashley and I am an online student. I have been studying online since year 11 and 12. I actually did those online because Camilla doesn't got an 11 and 12. And like hell I was going to Kalgoorlie. <laughs> so I did that and then I moved on to South Regional TAFE where I started studying graphic design, which is actually amazing, I love it. Anyway, so I did certificate three, certificate four and I'm currently studying my diploma. Now, why I studied online is, well, a big one is the location. I've been to Cambelda, tiny, tiny place, itty bitty, you wouldn't even see it on a map, it's not on most maps. But it's a very pretty place. Lots of flowers, wildlife, kangaroos, very safe as well. And cheap, ooh man, cheap rent. That's, that place is like seriously great. But so, and also my family's been there for generations. So I've got like ancient family members all over that place. But not just ancient family members, because I was born there, I've known everybody in the community since before I can form memories. So they all know me really well too, so it's like having one really, really big nosy family. Everyone experienced being a celebrity moved to a small town. So 
yeah, apart from that, it was, yeah, so st online study gave me everything I wanted because I didn't want to go to the city. My brother did, and he's not going so well. It's too expensive and too remote and too removed from everything he's known. So, go next. All right, available support. I've been really lucky with that one, like I mentioned, because I've got my community as well as everything else, but I also had my lecturers, which, although they're very far away, they're very, very easy to get a hold of. So if you have like a question at one o'clock in the morning, you email them or you put them on the forum and like they answer like the next day, it's like so quick. And you don't have to like interrupt them before the next class, which is like a big thing with actual, like, you know, like proper, like going to like a place education. So like, yeah, so you don't actually have to interrupt them, which is great. So, and classmates are also there if you ask a question on the forum and like somebody else is up at one o'clock in the morning too, they can answer you like right then and there. So that's also great. Like even though you've never actually met them, they're pretty helpful. But failing that, you've also got like for generic questions, the internet, the internet knows everything. You've got like a really weird question that you thought you'd be the only person in the world to ask. Seven billion people, man, you're not the only person to ask that question. <laughs> so like you go to Google and like Google knows everything. Like my mom's always, whenever I ask my mom questions now, she just goes, go to mother Google. Go to mother Google, mother Google knows everything. But the other kind of smart I get, like not, life's never easy. Like it's never as easy as you thought it would be. So when you're studying but life's falling apart, your family's there because you didn't leave them and your community's there as well because you also didn't leave them. So when you're struggling, they're there to support you as well. Like not with study questions, you ask them and they probably give you a blank look and say go to Mother Google. But if you've got like life questions which is making it hard for you to study, go to them and they'll like, help you out with that one as well. So I've been lucky with that. Of course, although my support has made things easier, there have been challenges. <laughs> A big one is because online learning, it's 100% self-motivated. If you don't do it, it's not gonna get done. It's one of the few places in your life where you're not gonna have a boss breathing down your neck, a teacher breathing down your neck, and no one's breathing down your neck saying, where is that homework I gave you? Or where is that assignment I gave you? If you don't do it, it doesn't go. And the only thing that like, fails for that is you and the money you spent on that course. So that is a challenge that comes up. Also distractions. You're constantly connected to like a world of answers and a world of like everything. It's a Pandora's box, but you're also dis distractions. So, so many distractions. It's a Pandora's box out there. Cat videos are just the tip of that iceberg. <laughs> so like you go there and first you're answer asking questions like that you're not really interested in, but you need to get that ass assessment done. And then you find yourself in the pit of YouTube watching foreign people do weird things. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I am not, I, and that's, that's a big problem because you're connected to like a world, a, a world of answers, but also a world of distractions. Also, that's not including Facebook and all that kind of stuff. Refresh, 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 still nothing happening. My, fan, my friends and family are boring. <laughs> but yeah, and then there's also time management because you're like at home and things slip away. First, you're just gonna go do the laundry or first, you're just gonna go and see your friend down the street and then before you know it, you've got five assessments due and it's like, wow, where did the time go? Not that I'd know, of course. Hey, Caroline, she's my lecturer. I did not say that out loud. <laughs> so yeah, you like, that's a time management. If you don't do it, things can get away from you pretty easy. But it's, there's also another thing that kind of shows up where you don't really realize it until you're pretty deep into it is isolation. When you're out in the middle of nowhere, where I live, <laughs> you're not anywhere close to your classmates or your lecturers. And sometimes you can find yourself feeling like you're totally alone in the world. And that's a little bit tricky to get around because when you've got relationships through the internet, they lack depth. There's something you can get within like five minutes of talking to someone face to face, which years of knowing, knowing someone online you just don't get. So although you have like an okay working relationship where you can get questions and answers out of them, you don't really know them, which can make it feel like you basically know a robot and they're not a real person. But they are real people, but yeah. <laughs> Next. So that's why it's really important to stay connected. The school's online forum is good for that. Your classmates and your lecturers and all that are always there. And then you've got things like Skype, like video calls and stuff of that nature. Like if you want to. That doesn't really bridge the gap, but it helps a little bit. And then you've also got social media like Facebook and um, Snapchat's really for only if you know people really well. You're not going to do that with your lecturer or your classmates. But your friends and everything, that's great, like for staying connected like with emotional support and whatever. Then there's also general forums. Like if you are studying, like for me, graphic design, there are general forums where you can go there and there are people which have like lots and lots and lots of experience. Like more experience from all over the world. And you can ask them and like they'll give you questions which are unique perspectives. You would never get them from like anywhere else. 
So then there's also email and instant messaging like Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So really, there are ways to stay connected, but you've got to make sure you stay on top of it. Otherwise, the isolation does kick in. Of course, that's what I said. There's not a whole lot of perks. Aside from being able to keep family commitments, like if you have kids early, it's no longer like a death sentence for poverty forever and ever and ever. From here on out, you can have kids and actually move up fairly easily. Also, you're able to keep a full-time job. With full-time jobs, <laughs> they have this really nasty thing where they actually like you to be there nine to five. So if you've got like a proper, like if you actually go to a university, they expect you to be there as well. And if you're working nine to five, you can't be there Thursday, 10 o'clock. So that means you're left with flexible jobs and flexible jobs that'll actually take you when you have no experience generally don't pay well. You know what I like to do? Pay bills and eat. So that's why you're being able to have a full-time job and get an education, which doesn't stunt you like, where I'm from, Campbell is a very small place. You either move and get an education or you stay and get into the mines. Mines pay really good money and they don't require much experience, but by the age of 50, you've got to retire. And the retirement age is creeping up and up and up, and you can't do that. So this way you can go into the mines if you wanted to, get an education, and when you're too old to work for mines, you can actually move on. Or, you know, leave earlier once you've made your money there. So, yeah, it's great. Also, no commute. Who doesn't like, who doesn't like no traffic? No traffic, no waking up early, no paying fuel, no, oh no, my car's broken down, what am I gonna do? I'm a poor student with a car that doesn't go. So there's no commute, which is amazing. And then study anytime, anywhere. You wanna study poolside, 12 o'clock at night, no chicken suit, you do you, you can totally do that. So it's like, and you're not being a distraction, which is extra great, because being a distraction is a bad thing in an education environment. But if you're home alone, you can totally do that. No, you do you, being weird is totally okay when you're by yourself. Also, it's disability friendly. I've been in and out of hospitals now for the past four years and I've had all kinds of weird scheduling issues with my like appointments and whatever. But these work around it. Like I have never missed a day of school. <laughs> Which, you know, who's to say that's an a perk? Ah, look, I'm done. Thanks for listening, everyone. Ashley, that was compelling and engaging, and that was a genuine applause, so congratulations. Uh, how can we not learn? Now, this part of the session, of course, is about you. You last year said you wanted plenty of time for questions. Well, they often say, be careful what you wish for. So we're going to have roving mics, and I'm going to put it to you in a moment to please engage with this panel. But whilst you're warming up your five favourite questions from each table, uh, I might ask the panel to contemplate on a message. Ashley's message then uh, was really important. Why? Because we started out the day the minister articulated the importance of student experience, the student journey. If we get that bit right as educators, we get that bit right. Now, Ashley talked about the importance of support networks, the role of technology, self-motivation, distractions, I thought that was fantastic. Uh, time management, isolation kicks in. From all of your individual perspectives, and we can probably start at this end, I'd really like the panel to reflect on, well, so what? Listening to those challenges from a student, listening to those dimensions of learning, like flexibility is fantastic, but wow, it's easy to get distracted. How do we use technology to keep learners, and I'd like Ashley's perspective as well, learners like Ashley engaged? So Julie, we might start with you, and then please do it from the, <laughs> from the table whilst okay. the, war, the room starts to warm up. And believe okay. me, if there's no questions, I'll ask you one. Um, I was sort of thinking about what Teresa said about needing to change ourselves. So I think the message is you've got to allow yourself to be disrupted. I mean, that's why I did some of that Education 3.0. That's why we have the Futures Observatory. We bring everybody in and expose them to it. So you need to allow yourself to be exposed. I mean, typically, as Rod has said, we, you know, our children disrupt us, so we're learning from the next generation. But you can't actually change the way you think, your values, and everything else, and then actually do something, try something about it, unless you allow yourself to be disrupted first. So I think that's the challenge for every one of us every day, really, to allow yourself to be disrupted, because um, that's why otherwise it feels like a dagger to the heart when somebody says, 
you should change your practice because you've been successful. You've learned that way yourself. So I think that's my sort of key message. Um, you know, rather than wait for someone else to tell you what to do. Ashley, what's your message for the educators to keep you engaged? If I knew that, then it'd probably already be working, wouldn't it? It sounds like it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's the answer. Never be afraid of an answer. <laughs> Keep moving then. I'm, do I'm dying up here. <laughs> so what, what was the question? The question is, uh, li li OK, now, now you're testing my memory. Uh, listening to Ashley's message about all of the distract, like all of the benefits, but also the distractions of, of online learning, what, based on what you've learnt, and particularly your research, What's your message for the audience? How do we use technology to keep people engaged? I think it's really important to present the content in many different ways because there are so many learners. There are still people who like a learning guide and a set of written questions. That, that there are vet students who are like that, but there are also students like Ashley, remote and needing the education or the training so to have that available as well as an alternative to have to met for this exact same content, many different ways of presenting. Uh, that's the only way I think we can um, accommodate all learners' needs across the whole VET sector, which is really diverse. They're not all Generation Z students. Very true, very true. Tegan. Uh, maybe another point is that in all the different industry areas, there's already a wealth of knowledge about what apps and programs and technology is important. So I think industry engagement is really important in that way and building those relationships and finding out what needs to be taught and then and then incorporating that. So finding out what all those, what's there and what needs to be taught, learning that ourselves and getting our heads around it and understanding the features and then passing that knowledge on. Okay, pressure's on. Now I'd like for those who want to ask a question, put your hand up, we'll race a microphone to you. I'm looking for hands in the air. Don't worry, you're not buying anything. Up, up the <laughs> Some over this side as well. First question, well done. Hi, this question is for Teresa. I believe that I heard you say the way we will be, um, the way we were taught will be the way we will teach. Can I have confirmation of that? Because I totally disagree. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the question. What I mean by that, um, the only way that we would ever know how to teach is how we have been taught before. We've seen um, from a whole of our education, we've seen how um, the teaching practices have been. How do we know what other teaching types are if we haven't seen them? So, so I guess for most of us, if we grew up um, and most of us in this room probably did through the transmissive um, mode of education where we are like the teacher up there and the students down there and we go to teach without much pedagogical training because Cert for training and assessment doesn't provide that, remember, for most of our lecturers. How do we ever know to teach anything different from what we already know? We're certainly not taught how to do that in our teacher education programs. Certainly not in the vet sector. We do in the high, um, sometimes in the higher education. They're not taught how to teach either. People are employed on the basis of their content knowledge. What I'm saying is, in the vet sector, we we don't necessarily have the pedagogical knowledge. That is the science of teaching. Other panelists would like to reflect on that. Um, I just like to give you an example of this. I, I, I you know, I also realised um, when I arrived at UWA that there were. A fantastic people there who'd been successful because they'd come through the transmissive mode of teaching. So uh, for all new lecturers now who are generally recruited on their content, their knowledge, they have to have a PhD but they've never been taught to teach, they actually go through an entirely online module which is about creating your future teaching. Um, there was resistance, people thought couldn't believe that I was daring to do this to UWA lecturers, um, but I can tell you there's 130 have now completed and the program is building up and every single one of them says it's really tough being an online learner, you're modelling the way that our students learn 
and you're putting us through it. So that's the kind of thing that I mean by disrupting and modelling alternative ways of doing it. I'm going to check with Teresa whether that's the kind of thing she means. Absolutely. Okay. That's what right. I mean. yeah. Well done. Uh, they could have gone the other way. Uh, look, and I think adaptive, <laughs> adaptive learning and picking up pieces throughout our lives in, in, in building our own strategies are important. There's another hand in the air. There's one here, but we'll go to the back first. Sold. Um, firstly, thanks to all the speakers. Um, really very interesting session. Deborah Lunt from North Metro TAFE. Um, cert 4 TAA trainer <laughs> as well. Um, look, I just wanted to say, I think, um, you know, if we can open up um, the learning spaces, and I think you've all highlighted this in your talks today, if we can genuinely open up the learning spaces, we're in a great position to actually have our students who are very au fait with technology teach us um, on, on a number of those sort of tech you know, the latest apps and all those sorts of things. That's certainly been my experience anyway. So here's to opening up um, the learning space, whether it's online or face-to-face. -face. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any reflections on that uh, from the panel? No, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, here. here. Oh, hi, Travis. Oh. <laughs> Stuck up behind you. Uh, I guess my question is for Teresa and well, for all of the panellists. Thank you for the presentations. Um, just going back to the, I, I guess, even the, the nomenclature of the Certificate for in Training and Assessment and the Diploma in Training and Assessment, do you have a sense that the, um, I, I guess, anxiety about compliance and content knowledge and assessment can be, could be a potential barrier to um, vet lecturers moving towards a more constructivist, problem-based learning approach. That there's a, there's a sense that if this isn't covered and we are audited, there's going to be a risk here. A very good question. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah. That's a real um, problem because our units of competency and our qualifications are so prescribed, there's no room for er experimentation. And even the qualifications themselves are very much behaviourist, um, behaviourally orientated, so there isn't any room for innovation. Um, and in, certainly in my findings, I found even that teachers had lost confidence in their conf um, content knowledge. They weren't, they didn't feel confident about creating their own resources. Instead, they relied really heavily on commercially produced resources. They had lost the confidence because the content that they had to teach was stipulated by the training packages. And therefore, their content knowledge was being undermined because even the language within in which the units are written was foreign to the um, to the staff, to the teachers. So, given that it's incredibly difficult for vet practitioners to go and do either an undergraduate or postgraduate qualification in in education, which does really put that student-centred approach, you know, to the forefront. What's a possible alternative or option for this sector, which is incredibly burdened anyway with other workload things? Yeah, one of the um, solutions I proposed uh, um, earlier was to um, was in our professional development programs to make sure we actually talk about the teaching of it, and not just the teaching, but also to combine the, how we teach the content using the technology. Like the three of them are so intricately connected, so it's not a matter of um, learning technology on its own. It's a matter of seeing how technology can change the content and how it can change our teaching. Um, there is, a, if anyone wants to do any further research on this, there's a model that I certainly used in my. Um, thesis, and that was the TPAC model. T is, te um, this is what teachers need, technology, pedagogy, and content knowledge. But the proposal I made was converted into a VET PAC model, so V-E-T, um, P-A-C-K, where learning was actually seen as a social, um, a social activity, because many of us are working with workplaces, with industry, so it's not just the teacher who's responsible for providing the training, so turning it into a more socially constructive thing rather than just us feeling that we've got full responsibility for imparting our knowledge onto the student. Te Tegan, could I just ask your reflection? Like you don't seem to be, listening to your presentation, a teacher constrained by the notion of compliance. You're really focused on your learners and how to make that work. So how do you work between you know, training packages and, and just making them work? 
I think that the the problem still remains. I still uh, I, I still see that with a, as a problem and face those challenges, um, as we all do. And I think we we deal with it in different ways. We put so much work into manipulating our documents and trying to make them. Um, excellent and compliant at the same time and it's it's a really really difficult task sometimes impossible or we have yeah we have compliance documents and then we have our training on this side and they're completely separate and we just do this because we have to <laughs> and it's not it's it is not uh, the best way and I think that's what everyone everyone is struggling with um, I wish I had more answers. No, that's a good answer. Good answer. And for the regulators in the room, can I say manipulating means continuous improvement? And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, question over back, back here. Okay. Red coat, and then I'll come to the front. Am I missing the periphery? Please yell out if I am. Hi. Um, this is more of a, a comment than a question, but um, as having worked in private RTOs um, under DTWD business rules um, as opposed to TAFEs under profile funding. I found that the business rules are, are stifling um, a lot of the ability to be able to offer student-centred um, learning, especially where you've got a business rule which said that 70% must be face-to-face -face and only 30% can be on of learning or self-paced uh, self-paced learning or online learning has to be on top of that so um, and they're looking at time frames of you know starting units you can't start the units all together so you can't have students doing project work which address all of the elements um, that they're doing so when they're doing their maths they're also doing their computer unit and they're also doing their reading unit if they're doing we were doing general education um, they want you they only want you to start certain units so therefore you're actually delivering training that you're not getting paid for um, but so I've, I've found that um, while all these ideas are great and um, you know, obviously work best for individual learning that we also not only as teachers need to change but also the regulatory bodies need to um, adapt their business rules to allow for those flexible um, delivery programs which are developed um, in the needs of the student rather than just focusing on what they want to pay out for what they believe is <laughs> Valued you, yeah. learning when you are letting the student direct the learning and what they need to learn rather than having someone at the front of the class going this is what we're learning today we're all learning the same thing even though the students knowledge is different the capabilities are different and their progress to learning is different so um, while I think we all acknowledge and, and accept um, that we all need to change I think there's a broader issue as far as implementation goes there. Look, thank you for the comment. Uh, uh, I probably won't take that to the panel. Look, it's an important reflection, though, and it shows that it's not just teachers that have to adapt. It's not just regulators. It's also the whole procurement frameworks and the like. And there's, of course, risks that those sorts of bodies are trying to cover as well. I said, yep, you'd be next, and then I'll... Yep. Hi, Michelle Hode from North Metropolitan TAFE. Uh, we've talked a lot about some of the constraints, I think, that we face, and we all realise that, you know, that, that that's something that we need to deal with, and... And Julie, you said about disrupting ourselves. I guess one of the things that I wonder about the panel's reflections on is, um, in the time I've been in TAFE in regional Western Australia as well as metropolitan, I've been amazed at, I think, how far the VET sector is actually ahead of other sectors. You know, we haven't talked much about our traditional trades, but, you know, the flexibility of training packages, the way in which it is, you know, multiple different competencies and clusters and the flexibility around del delivery and holistic delivery in a, in a um, industry standard, competency-based context. I mean, I think that that has really um, taken all the rules away from you know, more traditional education sectors in terms of how engaging it can be and the student experience. I think that most people would say, um, and certainly our students reflect on their experiences as amazing and as absolutely relevant, engaging, you know, and informing on lots of different kind of layers as well as you know, the complexity of the learning environment in which they operate. So I guess just what are the reflections on that? I, I kind of would really like to see that side of it because I think it's something we should celebrate. Yeah, thank you for your passion. Yeah. Did you reflect on that? Any reflections? I think the VET sector has done a brilliant job as well. It's done a really, really good job over the years and compared to a lot of international um, TVET, Technical Vocation Education Training internationally, Australia has done a really good job and I think we model ourselves on the um, British 
UK model. But um, I think here, what we're really talking about here is how to engage Generation Z. That's a really different ball game. You know yourself, I think someone said, they're doing five things at once. How are they pos possibly processing the information? So that's what we, as vet teachers, need to be looking to. How are we going to deal with this? We can't lose them. So we have to change something about the system to accommodate these, because they're not turning up to the universities, because um, they can watch their lectures online, but then they get home and they're not watching the lectures online, so they're failing. So there's, there's a whole heap of issues, and it could well be our students, the more options we provide, I guess, for them, as well in all of our different flexible delivery modes, we could well be losing. What, in the traditional trades, though, because they're not actually experiencing learning in that way, have you, has your, your research actually looked at the, the methodology that's engaged there and, and how kind of technology is creeping into that? Because certainly I see it. Mm. And that's a really good thing because um, if it was the transmis transmission um, model, there would only be that lecturer talking um, to a group of apprentices or teaching the group of apprentices or trainees, whatever the case may be. But with the technology, the technology exposes that student to 10 other tradesmen or women around the world. Therefore, they're getting a much broader understanding of what that content or what that trades involve. It's not just the master apprentice anymore. Yeah, we, we should not forget that a key distinguishing feature of what we do is the I word industry, the vocational nature of what you all do and, and, and regardless of learning style it does need to constantly introduce real productivity in the workplace. Now there's someone up the back with the microphone already, thumbs are up and then I'm going over here somewhere, yeah? Cool, yeah we've got a statement from somebody at South Metro TAFE um, and we'd just like Tegan if you could to comment. Uh, there is research that this fast-paced multitasking generation is becoming more stressed and some educators are deliberately slowing the pace to enable students to focus and to breathe and success is being reported. What are your thoughts? I think um, by no means, I, I didn't mean 100% um, fast-paced 100% of the time. I think a bit of a balance would probably be good there. And yeah, I mean definitely I, I think that there's time to have um, a slow pace and, and to have breathers and reflection time and to encourage um, both, pace, both paces. But I think, yeah, it's just the balance. It's just not, not a slow pace the whole time where people are bored um, and not the other way around too. We're all looking forward to that opportunity to have a quiet time. Now, there's a question over there. There it is, the lady in green. Thank you. Vivian Scott, the Centre for Training Excellence at North Metropolitan TAFE. Um, my, my question is um, about the notion when the students are producing a lot of the content themselves and, and so they're being driven to do that and there's sometimes that concern that maybe they're not addressing everything in the unit of competency. And I was also thinking about when people have laughed today about how Dr Google knows everything. So is there room for then teaching the students how to reflect on what it is that they're getting and how useful that is against the unit of competency. Have any of you looked at that with what you've been doing? Do you know what I mean about looking at the, the criteria to reflect at what they're getting, to make sure they are on track, that they're not just sort of watching all those interesting videos that, that you talked about? Panelists? Jean, go for it. Um, a few of you might know that uh, my life's work has been something called the five-stage model, which is called the SAMA model. It, again, is open on my website and the model is there. Um, and the fifth stage of it is, is really metacognitive learning for the learner, which generally means, all of you have said, plus a bit more, but their ability to reflect on what they've learned as well as uh, to reflect on how they're learning as well as what they're learning. And it is, there's absolutely no doubt that that is uh, the sign of a mature learner, someone who will become a lifelong learner, who will be able to benefit from other formal or informal education. Um, however, you can't really teach it um, as such as a subject or a separate thing. You really have to build it in to the understanding of a scaffold. You know, we, we're getting more and more understanding that the way to be successful, especially with all the distractions and the multiple ways of doing things, is to pull students through a scaffold that moves from generally access to the learning 
um, engagement with each other, engaging with the, with the content or context of what they're learning, and ultimately giving them activities that enable them to practice metacognition in just the same way as they're practicing whatever the skills are of the course. Um, so it is terribly important, but it's probably the hardest thing that we provide for them. But on the other hand, there's great value if you can. Now, uh, what you don't know is uh, to be able to get a coffee at uh, morning tea, you have to be able to describe metacognitive theory. <laughs> so I hope you are paying attention. Now, you're doing very well. Uh, uh, next question, next challenge, next issue to raise with our panellists. Surely we're not out of ideas yet. Can I no, just... there we go. We've got a question. Oh, Teresa, what you can make your comment while the microphone's being oh, moved. I was just going to add to um, Vivian's question. The role of the teacher is still really, really critical, especially for that purpose to bring them back, in, particularly in the model of the flipped um, classroom, where that's why they're going back into the classroom. The learning happens before. Then they come into the classroom, and that's where you guide and teach them the skills of evaluation, discrimination, etc. So what we're talking about is not to undermine the role of the teacher. They're still really important as the guide on the side or as a effective facilitator. I so I just wanted to add that, Vivian, to your question. Certainly, a lot of the evidence I see is the role of the teacher is even more important, including the importance of, of helping our learners understand that verifying what you get you know, from the World Wide Web is a really important part of the process. Like, just because it comes up first, that doesn't mean it's true. Now, there's a question over there. Oh, it's uh, more by way of a comment. Shane O'Brien from MPA Skills, and we deliver apprenticeship training in trade areas. Um, it's really about the fact that the expectation for trainers in the, the period, the last 20 years, the training model was developed 20 years ago in our system in WA. And the reality is over that time, trainers have been expected to train and assess. Suddenly, validation has become a massive impost that's been um, uh, presented by the system. And then really, there is no resourcing for any innovation or development in training methodology. It's just not built into the system. So there's this unresolved tension between these innovations and the fundamental funding model across WA. Thank you. Um, and, and I hear those reflections across the nation. It's a real challenge. And yet, you keep doing what you're doing. And um, if you look at the results that you achieve across the sector, they're quite remarkable. Uh, any reflections on that from the panel? Or happy to go to another question if there's one before I test the panel once more? I think we've worn you out. I think more to the point. Everyone's thinking, how do I get the first in the coffee queue? Uh, so, panellists, perhaps to finish off, we've got, we've got 10 minutes, but we can finish early because they've been such a good audience. <laughs> I just would like, if, if, you, if you could give one message to the future of, of uh, uh, vocational education in Western Australia, to the people in the room, just one message to, on how to make it real, how to make it work, what would your reflection be? Perhaps we'll start at the other end this time. Tegan, who's out there doing it? I guess... Uh yeah, if for anyone who is in the position uh, to be changing the system from, um, from above and changing the, stru the structures and changing these, the frameworks and changing these issues that we're all talking about with compliance and assessment and documentation, then, I mean, everyone's hoping that you'll do that. Um, but in the, in the situation we're in, um, we're working what we, with what we have, I guess it's just about working together as much as we can, sharing our ideas, because we've all got great ideas, and whether we've only got one or two, between us all we've got, hmm. we've got lots and lots and lots, and being really creative, as creative as we can be, and just putting the time into thinking about it, because we can do it. And I know I'm in access, and perhaps uh, things are a little bit uh, easier with those um, you know, lower certificates, and being able to um, create compliance documents that are, that are still really vibrant and um, I've, I've heard that people say that it's easier. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I think we can all do it. And, and if we just get together and be really creative and innovative, I know it's like, for example, my uh, uh, maths assessment is in those scavenger hunts that I was, was talking about before. So you, you can do it if you think outside the square. And just, um, yeah, just if we just get rid of those sort of attitudes that are, that are trapping us and boxing us in and just think outside the square and just, and just think that, we, um, 
we have to engage this generation. We have to, that's our job and that's our role. And while we're there, we, we have to drop those attitudes and be able to do it. So it's just about doing as much professional development and sharing all our ideas and working together towards, towards solving those issues, I guess. Thank you. I think the greater emphasis now on the amount of training, remember it used to be the um, emphasis was on assessment, now it's on the amount of training, which is very timely. So as we go through our documents when we're trying to say, you know, stipulate, well, how many hours are we going to spend on this, how many hours training, that's when it's going to cause us to reflect, right, well, in that training that we're providing, what are we going to do? And it's not just a matter, you know, of a learning guide and a set of, um, exercises, because that's certainly my experience um, of education in the past. So I think with the renewed focus on this very important amount of top um, training, we will have the opportunity you know, to think, well, what can we be doing differently? Ashley? Well, really, you can make it as engaging as possible, but unless the person wants to learn, there's nothing you can do. So. <laughs> I've learned she gives very sobering messages. <laughs> now that's the right message, Ashley. Thank you very much. So uh, we need to understand it from the learner's perspective. Julie. As there's time, can I have two quick ones? <sighs> Look, you've been a problem from the start. But okay. <laughs> okay um, just one is a gap um, that we haven't yet discussed, and of course it may be that you're moving on to it later in the day. But the more digital technology you're able to embed and the more students use it and benefit from it, the more you've got the opportunity to use digital data to understand your learners better, to change the design of your courses, um, to help those who are struggling much earlier and to intervene sooner. So just one little thing I'd say, have a look at um, the whole role of learning analytics, it's generally done as a prediction, you know, can predict who might be struggling. That can be benign or otherwise. At UWA, we're actually using it to feed all the data we know about the students back to them so they can take their own actions <laughs> on the results of it. And it's all there, it's all been collected. You know this about all of us all of the time anyway, but you can get them into highly visual reports and they then become easy to understand, easy to interpret and easy for everyone to use, students and teachers alike. So that was just one thing. My, that was, that, well, that was one. only one. Oh, it was only one. The other thing is to say, what I do know is that sometimes if you're trying to change, uh, putting a label on something that's a bit different that actually promotes dialogue and conversation around it. So at UWA, we're now long, no longer using the word teacher or academic, um, and we're calling everyone who's responsible for a unit of learning a learning leader. Um, I'm, so we're trying to call them learning leaders, which tries to accommodate all the changes that are going on. Sure, they've still got authority. Sure, they've still got responsibility for their students, but they're actually designing the learning and then leading them through it. So maybe you'd like to think of a new word during the day today and start to label yourselves and your colleagues a bit differently. Think about what's on your business card, eh? So ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank the panelists? They're now free to return. You can go back. You can leave. Um, and I'll now hand back to Karen. Thank you.